My name is Tim Deverer. I'm chair of MORE. Welcome to the Movement for the Abolition of War's 21st Remembrance Lecture. Let me welcome uh, Assad Raymond. Previously, Assad was the head of international climate at Friends of the Earth. He's now the executive director of War on Want, which is a movement committed to ending poverty and inequality. His expertise has led him to be today at the forefront of the climate justice movement in the UK and around the world, helping to reframe climate as a racial just a racialized, sorry, helping to reframe climate as an issue of racialized capitalism, economic and social injustice. He's the co-convener of the Global Green New Deal project to connect the climate crisis, neoliberal equality, um, COVID and the historical exploitation of the global south. We're honored to have him as our lecturer. Over to you, Assad. Thank you very much, and thank you for this really kind invitation to join all of you. Yep, uh, as you heard, my name's Assad Rahman, I'm the Executive Director at War One. I'm speaking to you from Glasgow, um, having been here at the COP26 uh, summit and have been organising War on One, has been one of the founders and, 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 and organizers of the COP26 coalition, which brought together the, a very wide range of uh, movements and organizations here in the UK, uh, from trade unions, faith organizations, environmental organizations, but also migrant justice organizations, economic justice organizations, in a quite unprecedented sort of coalition that explicitly uh, centered climate justice, and um, also I was committed to amplifying the voices and realities of the Global South and really was trying to build the movement of movements that is needed for this crisis, which we all recognize is an intersectional one. Um, and some of you I know have been in Glasgow as well. Um, and just over the last two weeks. I, I say this because I might not be the most care. I think I've had about, I think in the last two weeks, I've had about two to three hours sleep a night. And I'm a bit of a walking zombie at the moment. Um, it was a very late night last night when the cop finished and, uh, um, well, uh, with an utter betrayal of both people and justice and, of course, the realities of the climate crisis. But on the positive side, I think the emerging movements that we've helped create. Uh, we organized 800 mobilizations globally as part of the Global Day of Action, over 191 here in the UK, put 150,000 people on the streets in Glasgow. Of course, in the midst of a COVID pandemic, a people summit with over 250 different panels and events, movement assemblies, and of course, also organizing the inside of the negotiations as well from climate justice organizations. and. Um, I don't know how many of you made it to Glasgow were actually inside the cup, but uh, I think you'll probably see it was the most inaccessible, unequitable cup that has ever been organised by uh, ever, and makes a mockery of the UK government's claim early in the year that the COP26 would be the most inclusive, the most accessible. Um, obviously, um, the UK has very, very poor planning about the COP really just, um, I think, refocuses the, our attention on how little regard they had for the realities of people in the global south. Of course, this COP was taking place in the midst of a pandemic. And we as civil society had called for the COP to be postponed. Um, the UK government, as you probably know, all know, has been one of the main countries blocking the lifting of the COVID vaccine patent, which has meant that, of course, in many countries of the global south, less than 1% of people have been vaccinated. Um, and for many people who are coming from uh, vulnerable, con vulnerable and frontline communities, the, even the idea of coming here and potentially risking themselves, but also risking their own uh, communities when they went back uh, in the midst of, of course, 
an economic recession where we've already seen hundreds of millions of jobs lost globally. Um, whilst ordinary people and working people have been the hardest hit. And we know even here in the UK, COVID has really sort of magnified the structural inequalities and injustices within our own society. And of course, exposed them between rich global North societies and the global South. Um, although some people seem to have done very, very well during the COVID pandemic, as you probably know, the 2000 <laughs> The billionaires uh, in the world saw their wealth increase by an incredible 5.5 trillion dollars in the last year alone. Um, so um, I, I I want to just I, I'm looking around and I'm 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 seeing so, so many uh, familiar faces and, uh, and and faces who know probably way more than I will ever do on on this issue. Um, and so I really just also want to really pay tribute. Um, to the work of Bruce and Paul and many others who really have helped, I think, to lay the foundations and the shape of this movement that we were beginning to create, um, that recognise that the climate has never been simply an issue about carbon. Uh, it's fundamentally an issue about the world that we've created, the unequal world that we've created. And unless we understand that it's a systemic crisis, our solutions to it will, could, will either amplify or just reinforce the existing inequalities and injustices that exist. Um, I'm hoping all of you know who Warhamont is, but if you don't, um, Warhamont was actually set up in opposition to the war in Korea. Its name, mission and vision derived from the call made by leading figures in the movement at, at the time, that the only war worth fighting is the war against want. Um, and of course, thousands of people responded to that call. And actually, I was reminded um, when I was coming to the COP, because we've been doing a lot on, on what the just transition or justice transition would look like, that one of Warren's first ever reports uh, 70 years ago was a plan for world development. And it called for swords to be turned into plowshares, for military spending to be redirected towards global tackling global poverty and inequality, for universal welfare systems and public services. Um, and of course, if only um, those in power had listened to, you know, all of our calls, uh, then we wouldn't be on the edge of the catastrophe that we currently face. What I want is also unique that it focuses on the root causes of poverty, inequality and injustice. So we work with a network of movements and frontline communities all around the world. Um, we don't set up projects as War on Want. We don't, you know, we're not like other sort of charities development or aid or anything like that we we very much amplify and work with our movement so everybody from landless farmers peasants to trade unionists working in the garment industry to frontline communities working extra against extraction both existing mineral and metal and of course the new wave of green extraction that we see in the green mi minerals and metals that are being touted for the new resource wars of the future um, we also focus on campaigning here in the UK, particularly against uh, focusing on the policies of our own government, uh, from trade policies, unjust trade policies, uh, policies around the power of corporations, but also militarism. So we have a very, very strong uh, 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 thematic area of work around militarism and security. Um, we focus on um, the UK's role in the arms trade uh, and also work uh, very extensively on uh, on supporting uh, movements and peoples, particularly facing uh, occupation. I'm sorry, I might, I'm going to just try and see if I can just shut off all my message apps because they're probably all beeping in the background. Uh, I will in a second try and just do that. It's on a different screen. Um, so we uh, work uh, uh, extensively with movements in the occupied territories of Palestine. Um, we also work with the Sahara people in Western Sahara um, and our call end occupation is part and parcel of our tradition of working around global justice issues and recognizing that um, uh, the role of the of the global north and global north what we used to call the west uh, in terms of its interventions in the global south has been one of uh, occupation, militarism, exploitation. Um, we all know that, um, you know, 
simply discussing the realities of climate injustice, you know, the killer fires and floods and famines. We can all see now on our television screens that are destroying the lives and livelihoods of millions of people in the global south, displacing them, um, or how climate amplifies all the existing racial, patriarchal, economic injustice within societies and between the richest and poorest societies. Um, and I think there is increasingly recognition that the climate crisis is a result of the very same form of racialized cap capitalism that is in an art connects everything from the shackles of slavery through to these gunboats of colonialism to what are called the noose of, neo of imperialism and neo neoliberalism. And at its root is this always been this idea, of course, that the lives of some people, particularly those in the global south, uh, can be sacrificed. And uh, we don't have time here, but we could spend a lot of time going right back to, you know, talking about how the doctrine of discovery, you know, brings this notion and, and legitimizes this idea of occupation and displacement and, and, and dispossession and begins to codify this idea that, of course, um, the, the lives of and, 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 the, and the very humanity of people um, in what was, of course, the West likes to call uh, discovered lands, which were, of course, were never lost. Um, um, and then how that justification, of course, is used all the way through uh, the last, the history of the last few hundred years uh, and the extraction of wealth and resources and, of course, exploitation of people has been sitting at the heart of that profit accumulation. Um, and we could speak for a very, very long time about, you know, right back to the 1970s, I mean, 1770s, how, you know, close to 86% of all of the investments in the British economy at the time, you know, came from the profits of slave markets, uh, slave plantations and slave commodities. Um, and that powered the industrialization of Britain. Um, I'm sitting here in Glasgow, and when I look around this beautiful city, you see, of course, incredible architecture, and, um, and Glasgow, of course, was built um, on the profits of much of that exploitation. Of course, there's a, another story of Glasgow, which is of radicalism and, and the fight for justice here, but there, these are the two stories of of, of Glasgow. And it's not just, of course, an historical uh, reality. Um, we know that just during the British Raj um, and uh, of, of India, for example, uh, when Britain uh, went to India, uh, its, GDP of, its GDP and share of global GDP was about 24%. When it left, it was 4%. And in that meantime, $45 trillion had been taken out of India. Um, and it said that Britain never financed a single war uh, from its own coffers um, and that the, it was the profits and the extraction of wealth from the global south that financed the massive expansion, both of, of capitalism in the new, new uh, colonies and uh, Canada, Australia, etc., but also the military, militarised and expansion of, of, of the empire. Um, but at the heart of all of these notions about when we talk about racialized capitalism uh, and that sits at heart of all of these multiple crises that we we, we we face i like to think sort of categorize it as this idea of sacrifice zones now you know in environmental justice work particularly from the united states the idea of environment of sacrifice zones was it came out when people were trying to explain how is it that you know in the united states you saw areas particularly where black hispanic white working class communities live which had this incredible high incidence of, of ill health cancer rates poverty and um and to explain that these environmental issues weren't simply abstract but that they were a result of political decisions that were being made often to cite the most heaviest polluting factories biggest infrastructure in some of the poorest communities the pe people who had the least ability to be able to affect the political process. And so in the United States, this idea, these are sacrifice zones that have been just hardwired into our economies, into our political systems. But 
I like to think, uh, I think the idea of sacrificing zones is not simply geographical it, or, or even at moments of time, but it's, it's, of course, clearly now, it's both an historical and a present day calculation that lives of the poorest black, brown, indigenous people can be sacrificed. And, and it still sits at the core of a lot of policymaking in, in the global north. So um, just because obviously uh, much of our media at the moment is dominated because of the COP26, um, I want to just say a little bit about the climate reality. Um, I'm sure mm -hmm. probably many of you are well aware of this. Um, um, you know, we all know now that uh, uh, breaching the critical 1.5 degree guardrail uh, begins and tips us into what is called catastrophic climate change. It's when runaway climate change begins, when um, the impacts that we're already seeing, and these are all impacts that are happening at just over one degree warming, will begin to spiral out of control and begin to amplify themselves. So you know, the hotter the planet, the more ice melt, more sea level rise, the more it will change our weather systems, more extreme weather, more extreme weather, more smelting, etc. And so our ability to be able to even begin to intervene and, and to be able to cut emissions becomes more and more challenging in the move. And, the, and we are then in an era of talking about how do we even begin to adapt to these realities. And in a couple of months time, the IPCC, which is the climate scientists of the world will issue a new report, basically saying that the ability of the world and world's peoples, particularly frontline people, to adapt to the climate crisis is pretty much reached uh, uh, the furthest it can go. And now we are moving into the, an era of incredible losses and damages. Um, so we know, and you know, you hear this phrase quite a lot, 1.5 to stay alive. Um, and we coined it many, many years ago, fighting around climate when we were trying to uh, convince policymakers and even actually uh, mainstream environmentalists in the UK that their call for a, a limits to two degrees um, was built on an acceptance of um, huge impacts in the global south. Already movements decades ago were saying no temperature level is safe, increase is safe, and it's deadly for many. And it's deadly for the people that you are not, you don't deem valuable. And it's deadly for our planet and our ecosystems. And I was just reminded as I walked was being here in Glasgow, it reminded me of Copenhagen in 2009 and uh, um, where then we were calling for, you know, um, the UN summit to adopt a limit of one degree. Um, and if only we'd been successful then, we would not be seeing the scale of, of, of impacts that were happening, happening here. Now, um, some tough I suppose, realities. And I think it's incumbent upon us to always know the truth um, because truth is, of course, something that is massaged quite a lot and it depends on um, the perspectives and the realities of those who tell you their version of the truth. Um, but I think for us as progressive people, it's really important to recognise that the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees is currently um, about between five and 10 years at current rate of emissions. And even that is based on a one in three chance of breaching that critical 1.5 degree guardrail. Um, now, none of us would get on a bus or a train if there was a one in three chance of it crashing. But that's what policymakers are, of course, telling people in the global south. That's the best we can do. But, in but instead of recognizing that, you know, the call for halving all emissions by 2030 and then being at zero by 2050 means that the richest could cause most of this problem. So 18% of the world's population, overwhelmingly in the global north, are still historically responsible for over 60% of global emissions. And that's at the lowest rate. There are other estimates that it's way higher if you begin to uh, calculate what we call embedded emissions or consumption emissions, so much emissions that are coming from the global south, but overwhelmingly um, for use in the global north. Um, but what we've seen here in, 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 in the halls of Glasgow is what has been termed carbon colonialism, the idea that the richest countries can seize even more of what's remaining of the carbon budget and that they can bank on um, technologies that simply don't exist. 
or the unproven risky technologies. And the one technology that does exist is um, called bioenergy bio and carbon capture and storage. It's the idea that you can grow more green things and they'll suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Now, the problem is, of course, is uh, we live in a world which has got a finite amount of land. And uh, um, actually, there's not a huge amount of land. If you currently look at, for example, land as we see it, um, you would need about three times the land mass of India simply to meet the net zero promises of some of the richest countries in the world. Now, that land doesn't sit somewhere magically that we are like, oh, we never use this land, let's do it there. Of course, the reality will mean it will begin to dis begin create a further sort of displacement of people. And of course, we know what that has meant. Uh, the, uh, militarized uh, responses. And interestingly, even the conversations around protecting current uh, forests, uh, or what is, the Prime Minister said was the, was the lungs of the world, um, is often pre uh, prefaced on this idea of, of creating reserves, um, displacing the very people who live and have sustained those forests from them. Um, and, and that's done, of course, because we only calculate the value of those forests um, in, in terms of carbon, not in terms of uh, how they are part and parcel of indigenous and forest dwelling communities, part of uh, their life systems and, and their relationship with land. And so uh, the, the second part I just wanted to just mention, because I think it's probably all over everybody's televisions at the moment with the COVID, of course, uh, back in 2009, uh, uh, what well, the then uh, Secretary of State for the United States, Hillary Clinton, plucked out a number from thin air of, and said 100 billion is what the poorest countries and developing countries need in finance to deal with both the climate impacts and for them to be able to um, uh, uh, adapt to this crisis. Now, uh, you probably know for 12 years, that 100 billion has not been met. And of the 100 billion money that has been provided, which uh, again, at its most generous, if you, uh, by the OECD, which calculates literally every penny of everything. Um, and so not um, actual climate finance. Um, it's about 60 billion. If you calculate new and additional finance, then it's about just over 20 billion. 80% of that is in debt creating loans. And of course, this is a moment when we know that both with the pandemic and the existing debt crisis, we've seen many, many countries uh, overwhelmed, uh, and but overwhelmed their own economic systems, their ability to be able to protect their citizens. And incredibly, um, the poorest countries are paying about 800 billion, 800 billion to the global North in unsustainable debt repayments and therefore more debt creating loans. Um, and, you know, from the estimates, and that's a far cry from actual need. If you look at the UN's own estimates, say at minimum you need, you know, between 1.5 trillion and 2.4 trillion, some estimating even higher a year for the next 10 years, if we want to try and transform and tackle both the climate crisis and inequality. Um, I'm just going to throw in there, obviously, um, the, often there's a, there's a paradigm which says, if only we gave more aid, everything would be okay. Um, of course, for every one dollar that flows to the global south from the north, global capital still takes out $24 from the south to the north. Um, the seminal book by Walter Rodney that uh, uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa sets out even in the 1970s, of course, the structural systems that were in place that mean that the wealth of the global south flows to the global north. And that, of course, is still a reality. Um, and I, I, I think for a long time, many in this, in this climate movement uh, turned their back on, uh, on the principles of, I, don't, I, I hope it's a word that we all used to use and we want to try and bring back of anti-imperialism, right? Of the notion that of course, justice goes beyond the borders of our nation state. Um, some of course, have always seen the climate as being just an existential issue. Um, uh, 
I was reminded of that when I heard the European Union's uh, commissioner in the halls la in the plenary last night, you know, talk put up a picture of his uh, grandchildren and saying, uh, my grandchildren will be, you know, 30 in that time, and I don't want them to be fighting resource wars for food and water. And, uh, of course, the reality is, well, those resource wars already exist now, and the children, it's not the children of the future, it's the children already in the global south who are facing this. So challenging that in terms of not looking at this through a narrow lens of just carbon or not thinking about it also um, in terms of how uh, the global north protects their own uh, economies and you see this very much in the narrative about you know, we have to protect British jobs at home. There's a flip side and a third pillar to that of course which is around the militarised responses that are being already part, baked into that. Um, and you know I think it's important for us as a as progressives and as part of the progressive movement to really re-establish and, 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 and bring and recognize the importance of that word solidarity. I've always said it's the most important word of the working class movement. It was the most important word in the anti-racist movement where I first uh, was involved decades ago. And it's the most important word in both the broader climate justice movement and this movement that we're, we're, we're in. So, and the reason why that for that, of course, is that we need to look at these issues beyond looking them in, in, in silos or, um, or focusing only on their impacts. Now, um, many people look at, for example, particularly on this issue about militarized and walls and fences and say, look, um, these extreme weather events are going to displace people. And there are UN estimates that one in 30 people in the future uh, will be displaced from their homes from extreme weather events. But simply looking at those people who are being displaced from extreme weather, of course, fails to recognize that the displacement of people is both from economic conflict, climate, and they're often results of the same systems. It's said, for example, that the, the you know, that the conflict in Syria, which has many, many different um, uh, reasons and as to why uh, it's been taking place and continues to you know, ravage Syria and, and bring misery to the people of Syria, was of course that Syria faced one of its longest ever droughts and forced and a food crisis and a forced displacement of people from rural to urban areas. That the, that the, conf that the both the positive part of the Arab Spring, but also the, the reactionary part in terms of the militarized response to the Arab Spring, of course, was was started because of not just a, a lot of, uh, of, 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 of issues around uh, democracy, but also very fundamental issues in terms of the collapse of food, of agriculture, food prices increasing threefold, etc. So we're already beginning to see that looking at climate or looking at conflict can't be seen in isolation and increasingly they reinforce and, and, and are a result of the same systems. Um, but neither, and we're faced at this moment where, you know, this idea of, well, we need to cut our emissions um, all at speed. Uh, and of course we do need to cut our emissions at speed uh, as done through in the name of protecting economic interests. And it's really interesting to see both some parts of what I would call uh, the red, left, and the green movement triangulate on the right, uh, to, to the right on internationalism and, and migration, using much of the same arguments that the right have traditionally used and, and begin to wrap itself up in this flag of patriotism. Um, some of you for, may follow European politics, see there's a new, there's a Danish red-green government in place and the Danish government uh, is applauded often because of its steps that it's taken in terms of around climate, but it's but in in to get elected, actually it decided that if it wanted to deliver on climate, it needed to move to the right and more right than the far right on issues of being anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim, and so some of the most draconian 
uh, and xenophobic laws in terms of anti-migration are now being are, are in place in Denmark. So on the one hand, it's a champion of climate, but on the on the same hand, uh, it's um, uh, repop is popularizing popularizing the narratives of the far right. And this argument is done because, of course, people argue. We need to win the social license. The only way to win the social license is to recognize where people are and we have to respond to that. And if if Europe is increasingly xenophobic and and and, and anti-migrant, then for us to succeed on climate, we have to accommodate those views and those ideas. Uh, and secondly, this idea, of course, is is and it's not a conflict one because um, um, there is also a conversation about we can't go too fast in the global north. Now, at the heart of the climate crisis, ultimately, uh, you can go slow, try and go slow, you can cook the books, but you can't feel the physics of climate, right? And so the only way you're able to go slowly in the global north is if you then calculate that it's, that what happens in the global south is baked in, that you are accepting uh, a, a level of, violence and displacement and disruption to the global south and that winning slowly really is a luxury only in the global uh, global north and not in the global south um and thirdly i'm just one sorry i'm giving you a very doom story about climate but the third element which i think is also really important for us to as progressives to be aware of in this conversation is of course that much of the conversations about transitioning in the global north requires um, a, a doubling of resource extraction of the global south. Now, uh, if you look at the OECD at the moment, they say that we currently used about uh, 89 billion tonnes of, of materials from, from a finite planet, and that within the coming decades, that will double. A sustainable level is about 50 billion. Now, we know when we talk about that, is in the sense of just saying, oh, it's material use. It doesn't tell the story, but actually what that is, is of course, poisoning of air, land, water, of communities and displacement, and increasingly a militarized response to communities. If we, when we, when we hear that two environmental defenders are murdered each and every week, that's what they're murdered for. It's murdered because they stand in the way of the extraction of those resources. And a new wave of green extraction, this time being told it's necessary to save us all, will simply further reinforce that securitization agenda. In fact, uh, before COVID, um, we were at BHB Billiton, which is one of the biggest mining giants in, in the world. It's do domiciled here in the UK with communities from Chile, Colombia and Argentina uh, talking about what was happening to them, the displacement, the, the, the role of the, of the mining company, the violence, et cetera. And uh, what I find really telling was that he didn't deny any of these impacts or anything. Uh, the chair and the CEO basically said, but we are needed for the green transition. We are the future. We are going to save the world. Um, and so there's already building a logic into that, which is, of course, that this next decades are going to be about these critical resources and we know rare earth minerals and metals most people are, you're all aware that um we current estimates already say we that, that you know our need would be 400 percent uh, of the of the existing lithium cobalt but it's not just those rare earth minerals and metals we will need a massive amount of iron and copper um and so the same ravages of extraction and violence reproduce itself and the same logic reproduces itself and the same then militarized response also uh, follows it um, so how do we look at this this moment well i think it really requires us to step back and and really begin to tell a very very different story of the world um, i'm often i have to say that um, you know, neoliberalism's biggest victory was not uh, the damage it's done in terms of our economic and political structures, not its forced privatization or its corporate power or its attack on our democratic spaces. It's actually what it did to all of us as people. It took away our ability to be able to imagine that there is anything different, um, that this, what the moment we live in is permanent. 
in that it is somehow uh, inevitable. And we've all heard this. There is no alternative. It's the market. It's this, uh, all the best we can ever do is tinker around the edges. But this is a moment for us, I think, to, to, to think really bold. Um, I don't want to quote uh, the architect of neoliberalism, uh, Milton Friedman, but he did say something very telling, you know, only a crisis perceived or real creates profound change. And, and what matters is, is uh, the ideas and policies that are lying around and, and our ability then to make the politically impossible to become the politically inevitable. And I think this is a real moment for us um, when we talk about the movement of movements that we all know, because none of us can win and fight where we are by ourselves. We recognize we're all, they are much more powerful than we are individually, but collectively we do have a hope. So I wanted to just say a little bit first about what that vision and before I say a little bit about securitization. So this is a moment where I think we need to be talking about a really radical anti-militarized global Green New Deal. The one that's, you know, anti-imperialist. Yes, it fights for 1.5. Um, says, of course, rich countries need to do their fair share. We need to have decarbonization in the global north. But it recognizes that that can't be done through a new wave of resource wars, that you actually have to think about energy and food in a very, very different way. So the answer isn't simply saying, let's end fossil fuels and go to renewable energy, because that's just simply impossible. We have a world where 60% of the world uh, don't have access to electricity or clean cooking. Energy demand is going to is massively increasing, yet we need to reduce by 60% our energy use. How do you do that? You can't do that with re simply with renewable energy. You have to start thinking about energy in a very, very different way. Energy as a social good, as a, as a product. What, what energy do we need that, for our well-being and for a productive economy and not for wasteful economy? And of course, one of the largest consumers of energy, as we know, is the military. So begins to begin to ask this question, well, what, what do we deem to be important within this future world we're all trying to create, similarly with food. But it also needs to, of course, tackle inequality and poverty. Um, similar figures, you know, um, often we're all told this story that global poverty is uh, falling. Um, and it falls if you accept that the poverty level uh, uh, is $1.90. Uh, if you accept, if, but the reality of actual poverty um, which is about $5.50 a day. Um, and that's not $5.50, it's the equivalent of what $5.50 would buy you in the United States. And if you calculate that way, then we're talking about three and a half billion people are on, living on less than $5.50 a day. You need about $10 a day to be able to escape poverty. You need about $15 a day to be able to live with some sense of dignity, not the overconsumption of the West, but to be able to say, I can feed myself, I can put a shelter, I can send my kids to education and I can access some basic services. So the ability to be able to live with dignity requires us to be at that, at that level. And that needs us, of course, to be making arguments about living wages. So of course, here in, this, in the UK, we're all, I'm sure all of us, uh, recognize that poverty wages and poverty pay the 4.2 million people who rely on food banks that the answer is you know 15 pound an hour but if we're making arguments about 15 pound an hour here we should be rebuilding that internationalism size then at least we should be doing 15 dollars a day um, in the global size and we all recognize of course in this last year more than ever that social protection and universal public services are the critical determining factor between uh, when crisis hits. And that's been as true for climate, for economic inequality and poverty as it is for COVID. So beginning to think about social protection and universal so public service, a global NHS, a global welfare system. These are not the ideas that are impossible. And I, as I said, 70 years ago, World War on One wrote that in its first plan, said actually it's totally possible. And it has always been technically possible. We have, it's, we have enough resources to be able to do it. Obviously, the main barrier has always been political will. But secondly, to put people's well-being ahead of this idea of growth and consumption of the rich. But to be able to do all of those, you really need to begin, and this is where I think we play collectively a really important part in this conversation, is when people talk about 
delivering those three things, you can only do them when you begin to say, what are the systems of oppression that sit in the way of doing that? Right? So people often say, well, that's racism, it's colonialism. And we have to say, absolutely. But that's also about militarism as well. Both in, the, in, the, in where resources are being funneled, but also the systems that have been hardwired into our into the realities of dealing with the climate crisis. And I'm going to come uh, it, it, it to that because there is a danger at this moment um, that this doom and urgency of the climate crisis begins to validate that any response in the face of this climate crisis is legitimate, right? Because if we are standing on the edge of catastrophe, then of course you do anything, but what you do really matters and what the logic of what you do really, really matters. And, um, and too much of our movement has, uh, has forgot, forgotten that our progressive movement was rooted always in anti-militarism, that we recognize this argument that uh, for plowshares, you need to beat the swords. Because this question about uh, there's never enough money, um, and I said we have never enough money for the 100 billion, but uh, we managed to find uh, over 12 trillion um, in the last year for the COVID responses, we found 16 trillion to bail out the banks in 2008. Um, but uh, it's impossible to find this paltry figure. And of course, that is a drop, a drop in the ocean when it comes to global military spending, and particularly spending by the richest countries uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the North. So uh, in this vision and why it's really important to recognize that, you know, our movements uh, have, have, have moved away and jettisoned these ideas of internationalism and militarism, and how do we rebuild global solidarity in there, um, is, a, is a really, really important part. And, and so I want to just, just maybe then talk about the second part, which is, you know, often people look at this moment and they say, um, yes, we have a vision of the world, and we know change needs to happen. And actually, it's not that uh, change is not going to happen. I think we all know change is now going to happen. There is no way that change is not going to happen. The only question is going to be, what kind of change will it be? Uh, who will be sacrificed? Who won't be sacrificed? Who will pay the heaviest price? And that, of course, is also about class. It's all, also all of those issues. But one area which... I think should be of extreme concern to all of us is this uh, narrative and this language that the climate crisis requires a new way, a language of walls and fences, buttressed by this argument about racism, and xenophobia uh, and, and anti-migrant uh, rhetoric. And, um, and I mean, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because it comes at a moment where, uh, the, the, our language, to some extent, in our critique of the world, is even being echoed back. I mean, I'm being struck by how many world leaders now talk about multiple crises and talk about poverty and climate, uh, even talk about just transition and, and talk about that we need, we know change is going to come. I, we had our prime minister talking about one minute to midnight and change is going to come. It will be the poorest who will be affected. We will, we need to have uh, all of this change. We've had the Secretary General last year talking about, you know, that free markets can't deliver, that we're no longer, we're not in the same boat. Uh, we've had the UN Special Rapporteurs talk about uh, climate apartheid. We've had the Secretary General talking about COVID apartheid. I think there's, of course, an increasingly rec in, uh, recognition uh, about that. So we, as this is a collective work that we all have to do, which is we have to provide an intellectual framework and political education. And we have to tell and can be the connective issue between these movements and tell a very, very different story right, as to how and why we get here. And many of us I know have campaigned for decades and we have a story to tell, which is, look, the global south is where it is, not because of some accident, it's because of course, of politics of militarization and, it, and military intervention, not just about the war in Iraq for resources, but go, going all the way back of 
of the overthrowing of Mossadegh, the assassination of Allende, of, of Patrice Lumumba, always fundamentally movements of leaders and of course that stood in the way of the extraction of resources from, from their countries for accumulation of profit and to be directed to the global north. And that's a very, very different story to the story of the climate just how has happened in abstract, that actually there hasn't been um, this bloody hand of the of militarism that has played a part and parcel of this. I think only when we begin to do that, that we begin to tell the story of militarization and securitization and begin to remind people that the answer isn't going to be that. So uh, I just talking a little bit ab about that, you know, sort of securitization um, agenda. Now, often progressives think that the right and, it's, and I talk about the writers in the far right, um, uh, are all climate denialists. Now, it's true that, you know, um, people like Trump and Bolsonaro, you know, do propagate uh, a, a climate denialism on one level, largely to protect the economic interests of, of, of uh, big industrial agribusiness and fossil fuel giants, etc. cetera. But, um, and that uh, alongside their climate denialism is a very, you know, militarized authoritarianism. You look at Duterte and the, the 40,000 people who've been killed in the so-called war on drugs, but also the trade union leaders that have been assassinated, environmental leaders, etc. You see similarly with Bolsonaro, uh, the huge repression of, of, of indigenous movements and of progressive movements. And these, and of course we saw with Trump, um, this sort of normalization of right, extreme right-wing populism and what it meant in, in, the, in the United States. But actually, if there's another part of the right, which I think is a lot more concerning for us. And that part, part, part of the right is the, what I would call the populist far right. And that populist far right, which emerged from the ruins of, 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 of the financial crisis in 2008, has been very adept at adopting much of our critique of the economic systems and but then tailoring it and using it to justify their uh, their their national ethno nationalist politics and we saw that of course with orban in hungary with salvini in italy le pen in france and you see it again and again and again it's a very sort of we it uses the language of no one left behind. The, 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 work, the working class have been failed by corporate elites. But the answer, of course, is that the, the threat of the, of the black, brown, Muslim, etc., requires us to protect our own. And they also use the climate emergency. In fact, they uh, make stronger use of climate science than many of our leaders do. And uh, they're much more literate about what the carbon budgets are. And they already are saying, Yes, this is inevitable now. It's cat catastrophic. The only question is going to be, how do you respond? And their argument is, it's impossible to respond. So what we need are walls and fences. And since we already saw the influence of that narrative of walls and fences, which has become so normalized that I think uh, many of us, you know, uh, uh, were highlighting these issues decades ago and said, there will come a time when the European Union will sit by and allow people to drown in the Mediterranean. People said, never happen. Liberal democracy in the West would never allow that to happen. Uh, we're built on the principles of human rights. And of course, we see that happening in the Mediterranean. We have a Home Secretary who's now saying, you know, if a border officer uh, uh, takes the life of, of, of somebody, uh, of a migrant, in, in the process of stopping them, um, that's totally acceptable and they should be able to do that with impunity. We've seen the whole rolling back and of course, we saw uh, the, the government talk about that the response to this migration uh, and, and the, these small boats is we need more warships, and we need more warships. But that, play, that story is not, isn't just there in extreme right. It comes from um, the role of um, I'm actually a very senior uh, uh, military, you know, the war apparatus as such. Um, if I always say, if you ever want to see who understood climate the best, look at what the military are writing. And that's been true from, uh, from, for decades. Um, the US military 
has long been writing about the climate crisis and has been putting forward this argument about um, that this moment requires climate security, right? And it sees this moment in, in policy and in probably policy framework that says, look, we're going to have these extreme weathers. There's going to be massive disruption and they're going to disrupt our economic, social and environmental systems. Therefore, what that means is a security issue. Um, and when we think about security issues, of course, that's overwhelmingly the security of the global north and the military sees that as then begins to say, well, if it's a security issue, what are the threats? Who are the threats and how do we address those threats? Um, and, and then how do we uh, begin to uh, uh, put in place policies? Now, part of the military are talking about, you know, what, how these extreme weather events will affect their military, right? Their, their bases or how will conflict happen or how will climate trigger new conflicts? So if you look at their thinking on, on, on climate security, it's really interesting. They're, they are pinpointing, listen, when we get to 1.1 or 1.2 and you start to see collapses in food production across the Sahel, it will lead to displacement of people. That will lead to violence and conflict. You will lead to, lead to people moving conflicts between pastoralists and, uh, 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 and and traditional farmers there will be and space will be created and of course very much fit, fitting into their logic of the war on terror and that these will be new theaters right new theaters of war will will start to happen because of this but they also predict there'll be new theaters of war because these crises will will create a demand for new resources right whether that's food or these new minerals but also of geopolitical so the more of course the ice melts in the arctic more possibilities of more extraction of resources and more uh, new shipping routes and so climate becomes this you know it's often they use this word threat multiplier or a catalyst to conflict and um, and the language within the military and you see it again, <laughs> again is around this we're going to be in a persistent conflict this is going to be more unpredictable than during the Cold War. And as such, we need to increase our militarized budgets. And I always rem remind people, we of course, all of us looked at, with it aghast at the, 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 at Trump when he started banging the drum about build the wall, build the wall. But actually the build the wall argument was first normalized by the US military in its reports. It said in future climate will uh, create a displacement of people and forced migration of people from the Caribbean and Latin and Central America and they will be a threat to the United States and our only option will be to build a wall between the US and Mexico and they began making the argument for increased border security for new border technologies and actually that budget began growing and growing and growing and they and so when Trump was looking for that was it didn't come from these ideas didn't come from the far right they actually were sitting with the u.s military that they picked up and started to, to talk about and it's not just you know right-wing leaders like donald trump if you look at even now president biden when he talks about climate he talks about it as a national security priority nato have got plans on climate and security the uk has declared it a security issue there's the, the, the increasingly this long, like language beginning to permeate everywhere. The UN Security Council last year had, uh, sorry, earlier this year, had a high-level debate on climate and security, right? And walk around the, the plenary rooms and the meeting rooms and the, what I call the Davos trade fair that's taking place at the COP26, and you see people talking about you know, climate and security as the justification for certain approaches saying this is now a security issue. And if it's a security issue, then that begins a logic uh, uh, and an approach in a particular way. Of course, the flip side to that is you also see those very same uh, 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 regimes talking about pro people protesting about climate has also been a security issue, right? Because we threaten <laughs> core part of the national or the economic infrastructure. And I don't think it's a surprise that the government is forcing through the most restrictive 
legislation on the right to protest that we've ever seen. Um, for effectively, we'll be criminalising um, what we've long fought for, which is a fundamental right, um, because the idea of a protest not causing nuisance and allowing people to define what nuisance is, um, is in itself um, begins that narrowing of civil civil society space. And anybody who has gone to Glasgow in the last two weeks will tell you one thing. Glasgow was like a militarized city. There were more police on the streets, more fences, more walls, more barriers than we've ever seen. And increasingly, that's how the state will also begin to respond to those of us who want to see change. So not just walls and fences for the outside, but walls and fences on the inside. And Anybody going to now the arms trade fairs will tell you that a lot of the technologies there now are no longer about just the guns and tanks and ships, which are all there, but they're all about new technologies, about fences and walls and facial recognition and control, etc. A new wave of what I call social and political control. And we've seen that in the increasing the number of walls and fences that are now littering around the world, right? The idea of, of a walls and militarized walls has become so prevalent that India is talking about a wall all around it. They we talk about wall in Kashmir. We've seen the same, the, the apartheid wall in, 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 in Israel and, and Palestine is being exported. And the, and the argument, of course, is this works. You see the Moroccans in a building, a, a militarized fence uh, around the Western Sahara as well. So this is becoming not just something in fantasy in years to come, but already a reality. Sorry, um, I'm talking on for a long time, Tim. I, I, how long have I got? I just want to be, just be conscious. Um, you, you're doing okay. fine. Um, I, I expect that we'll want to finish around 3.30. So cool. I'll, I'll, I'll stop in about five, 10 minutes then. I'll stop in about five, Great. 10 minutes. Okay. Great. Um, and, 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 you know, What's really, uh, I think, worrying for all of us, is, should be worrying for all of us, is that the very countries that yesterday in the climate negotiations were saying, um, we can't act any faster, we can't do any of this, are the very same who are pouring more and more money into defence planning around security. It's the UK, the US, United States, Canada, Germany, all of these countries are all beginning to say, Actually, our, we, I, I would say, and I've sat in policy meetings with policymakers, um, having worked at the UN for about 15 years, that they are planning for a two, two and a half degree world. And they see that two and a half degree world as being a, a, a world of violence and extreme and, and, and resource wars. And they're already planning for it. And they're already saying we are going to be prepared, and uh, and I think that that is something that should be of huge concern. And it's important, I think, again for us as a movement to bring that into this emerging new climate justice movement, that where people talk about uh, uh, and recognise fossil fuels and renewable energy, but don't really centre the importance of both preventing this new wave of militarisation, but also making the arguments, of course is that if we're looking for money in the finance and the resource and technology, it's there. It's just in the military budgets rather than anywhere else in the world. Um, Paul is here uh, on this call, so I, I, I know he's done a lot of the heavy lifting on, 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 this, on this area of work, really trying to draw a lot of attention to it. Um, but it is not just the military that is talking about this. I mean, it, 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 what should worry us is the number of, well, you know, uh, voices within broad civil society, which are also beginning to talk about uh, uh, using the security agenda. And, and, you know, I often warn people, you know, that making the argument we must act on climate because one in 30 people will be displaced from the world, you know, actually creates a logic that they want us to create. Uh, so we have to be changing that discourse from about, you know, the one in 30 people being displaced as this one in 30 people will ever cross international borders and come to the West to begin an argument about that we have to, we have to make sure, yes, people have the right to move, but people should have the right not to move. And the right not to move requires us to have a very, very different approach. And that approach is not going to be solved by military 
budget, by militarization, bombs, war, etc. It's going to be solved by the very things that we talked about at the beginning, public services, security in terms of economic security, not militarized, so militarized security. Um, I just wanted to maybe uh, uh, end, I suppose, in, in um, so much more we could talk about on this issue. So I'm just trying to think about it in, 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 you know, in, in these last few things. Um, as, uh, look, there, there, there are, you know, one of the um, uh, issues I think, which is, which is really important for us, I think, I suppose, and, and maybe an area we collectively need to be looking much, much more at is, of course, who are the businesses and corporations that are sitting at the heart of this new nexus um, because often they are exactly the same corporate interests that are have got links with the extractive industry with the new mining giants etc and I think that's a, a way for us to begin to tell a very very different story about when people talk about militarization because often people talk about it only in the it's country to country right it's when if the you, you it's when we bombed Iraq, but nothing about actually the web of militarization that takes place through private security, through securitization and this agenda, which actually is the state subcontracting that down into new private security uh, entities and forces. And, and of course, we know that, uh, that by this logic, it simply begins to even narrow the policy spaces for the kind of transitions that we we actually generally want. I'll stop there because I'd love to us to have a more of an opportunity to have a conversation with everybody. Thank you so much, Asad. That that was just were so many ideas coming out. Um that uh, but but quite a few people have asked questions, um, put questions in the chat, which is great. Um can I ask uh, Rona Topaz to unmute and ask her question. No, okay. All right, go go ahead, Rona. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, my question was uh, regarding the inaccessible nature of the uh, COP26. Um, I was wondering whether or not that was deliberate. Uh, because I just think <coughs> going forward, if we are going to paint some sort of alternative vision of, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a new sort of new green deal, as it were, whatever you wish to term, term it, um, I just don't want, you know, I, I'm wondering how important it is for, you know, for I, I'd, lo I'd love the idea of no one being left behind. I know it may or may not be a... Um, uh, a possibility if we have to coexist with capitalism, but I also believe that it's how capitalism is being applied that's the issue rather than capitalism itself. So, you know, the idea is that we should really think about a green future going forward with no one, as much as possible, no one being left behind, including disabled people. And uh, that would possibly lead on to my, uh, I was asking in the chat whether or not the, um, the events were, apparently the events were recorded for the alternative version of COP26, but the COP26 itself uh, wasn't on Zoom. So that leaves behind a lot of people who couldn't get to Glasgow for whatever reason, including disability. And of course, disabled people were actually locked out, speakers were actually locked out of COP, COP26 itself. So I'm just wondering if, if anyone could tell me why that was. Thank you. Asan? I'm happy to do that. Do you want me to take two or three questions or just answer them one by one? Okay, uh, uh, probably two uh, or three will be good. Um, so hang on a minute and I'll find some more. I have one, uh, which is, can the climate crisis be averted without the world turning its back on neoliberalism? Um, and David Collins, do you want to ask your question? Yep. Go ahead. The Climate Change Committee has effectively advised the government to conceal military emissions amongst civil headings such as arms under manufacture, warships under shipping, and warplanes under aviation. This means these destructive activities are not currently considered separately at COP26 or other COPs. Could you comment on this and suggest any actions? Cool, okay. So uh, on the question about accessibility, um, 
you know, we as global civil society actually called for this COP to be postponed. We said that holding the COP in the midst of a pandemic would inevitably make this COP inaccessible to many people. We said uh, that holding the COP and the UK government literally doing nothing to guarantee people you know, affordable accommodation in Glasgow, uh, to uh, recognise that um, obviously the vaccine apartheid issue uh, was, was, was key, um, but also the reality is that the last year, year and a half has been hugely challenging for many movements who have had to reorientate themselves to actually just become providing humanitarian support and assistance to their movements and to their people, right? Where the state has literally turned its back. And that's been true all around the world. So uh, we work with garment workers unions in, in Bangladesh, you know, uh, when the factory gates shut because of the big brands weren't selling here, they just threw workers out onto the scrap heap, right? No social protection, no public services, just people left. And uh, it was, you know, we're working with our unions immediate, just basically how will workers feed themselves and feed their families? You probably saw, you know, last summer, there was a moment where uh, those of you on social media would have seen like lots of images of, of in the global north saying nature is recovering, right? And pictures of deer and bear, boars and all these in, our, in, our, in, in cities. And of course that's amazing because it just shows also nature is still around us, but it was cut. At the same time, the reality in the global south was you had migrants in India, migrant workers in India walking a thousand kilometers uh, to return back to their homes. You had people lying unburied in the streets of Ecuador because it was overwhelmed the government of Ecuador. You had uh, in, in Durban and in South Africa, the shack dwellers who are, who are, who are without electricity, water, literally being uh, kept in military kind of enclosure in the argument, the, the argument being, you know, COVID. And COVID means there can be no movement of people. But when you have people who have absolutely nothing, locking them into it basically means you don't have any means of survival. So it's a very, very different story in terms of like, that, that reality, and we pointed that out to the UK government. I'd say the reality for the UK government was it wasn't that interested, and it hasn't been interested um, in actually do we as citizens of the world, do we have access to this event? Um, the venue is 10,000 people. They invited over 35,000 people. Every day at 12 o'clock, you'd get an alert saying work from home. These are people who traveled from all around the world, come to Glasgow and then told, don't come into the venue. We are told you can't go into certain parts of the negotiations. We were locked out in the negotiating rooms. We're not allowed. We were not allowed in the negotiating rooms because, of course, the argument was made about it's COVID. So they, there has to be a limit on the number of people in the room. <coughs> if we're not allowed in the rooms. How do we know what's being negotiated? How do we influence those outcomes? So we're already locked out. We're told to go on a digital platform. The digital platform, incredibly, you need to be registered and in the UK before you can access the digital platform. Um, so you you can't even like just go on the digital platform anywhere in the world. And then that digital platform wasn't working either. So it, the people who didn't have any obstacles, big business. The hmm. 500 fossil fuel lobbyists who were the biggest single delegation in the climate negotiations, the big businesses such as Bestos, et cetera, who are all positioning themselves as being the solutions to the climate crisis. Those announcements that were made in week one, I mean, they're interesting because, of course, most of them are vacuous. The vague promises that have been rehashed from previous, they can't be verified. They're just announcements. But also the idea that the state is no longer going to tackle the climate crisis. It's going to be outsourced. To big business and if you look at what bill gates was saying what jeff bezos what all these people were saying is it's going to be the big multinationals who are going to be the solutions to this climate crisis because they are the ones that are going to manage the new economies manage this how we both cut our emissions but also adapt it's a very it's a literally we're handing control of the world even more so to corporate giants so i would say it was done deliberately in terms of accessibility and on thursday um in an unprecedented move, 
all of the constituencies of civil society we saw these are these are the yeah. official yeah. UN bodies yeah. that represent the trade union movement, women and gender, uh, indigenous people, environmental organisations, uh, young people, um, and dis the disability caucus, which is now going to, which is at uh, this COP was finally recognised as a formal COP. All took to and took over a plenary and had a people's plenary, and then marched out of the of the COP saying we're so utterly frustrated, we're here and we're locked out of these negotiations, that we're unable to even be able to influence them. So I would say it's definitely, it's deliberately done. And the idea of why you want to do this is because you want to move the climate negotiations from being somewhere where every country has an equal voice and where we are able to be part of it, knowing what's going on, knowing what's negotiated, to one where they want to have really a lot of these closed door bilaterals so we will never know what the agreements are we'll not be able to ask until they're being, being announced there'll be bilateral in the back rooms or they want to go towards the kind of WTO system where it will be sitting in some remote city, city and they will be working on technical outcomes all of the time so locking us out of the very moment where actually we need to be a very much part of the conversation by because what really we're talking about is what is the world we're going to have because, as I said, change is about to come. Uh, in terms of the neoliberalism, look, um, uh, neoliberalism, uh, you know, it's often said that the climate crisis is the, is the, uh, is the best example of the failure of, of, of neoliberalism and market forces. And, of course, it is because it's impossible on the logic of neoliberalism, which has always, uh, you know, of course, their prior, prior, primary duty is, is uh, profit accumulation and... Uh, off the, the 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 what we call the the damages that are done, whether they're environmental, human rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are displaced to the state to respond to, right? So that's not in terms of their primary concern. You can say the forced privatization that neoliberalism has forced through the world has shown that it's you're unable to respond because this is the moment where you actually need regulation. And of course, neoliberalism has said that the only way that the economy is built is if you deregulate the economy, if you lift, as they were used to say, the shackles on private forces, private enterprise and private, the, uh, 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 private corporations will create the world that we want. Look, we've seen what the last 40 years of neoliberalism has done. Global inequality is at its worst level. Even in the UK, global inequality in the UK is now at back to and beyond Victorian times, right? So the idea in the fifth richest country in the world that you have 4.2 million people using food banks, <coughs> seven out of 10 people in poverty are in work poverty. So people are working, but still can't make enough money to be able to put food on their table and heat their homes and, and feed their kids shows you that this system just uh, a war on what we say it's not broken it was rigged it's been created in this way and the profits of course are being sucked upwards that's why the wealthiest increasingly every single year get wealthier and wealthier and whilst ordinary people i mean and particularly if you're in the global south your income at each year grows by roughly about two cents you need about i think it's about 200 years before you'll get to uh, what is now the poverty level in the US and you need about 500 years before you get out of poverty, even if you <laughs> accept that everything else stays the same. This is just, it won't work. And that's the biggest challenge to neoliberalism, that they're faced with a crisis that requires fundamentally all the things that they don't want. It requires us to regulate polluting in, in industries. It requires us to have a strong state. It requires immediate intervention. And these might be sound like radical things, but look what the, what we did with the COVID pandemic. We exactly did that. We said the private sector is not the answer. Uh, all of the European and the global North countries directly intervened in their economies to protect their economies and their citizens. They all pumped m huge amount of money into their public services. They had furlough schemes, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to do that on a global scale if we want to be with the climate in the climate crisis. The military carbon argument issue is, yeah, absolutely. It's really fascinating that in all of the calculations about countries' footprints, they don't include their military, right? They don't include the, the carbon mm -hmm. 
<laughs> of their military. And if the if the if you if you calculated the carbon footprint of the United States, I think it comes in. It'd be like one of the some like some of the uh, is it the fifth biggest polluting country in the world? You know, it's a huge, massive carbon footprint. Uh, and of course, you know. Sometimes it's, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm lost for words sometimes when I look at some of these things and they talk about, uh, well, the military is going to reduce its carbon footprint by, you know, greening its war, its war machine. We'll be using less carbon and we'll be using new high tech technologies, which mean we won't be using lots of oil and diesel to, to kill. We'll, and we'll, that's why we need more automation of our, you know, drones and et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, so... If you're dying from a missile from a green drone, doesn't make it any less better, unless, you know, doesn't make it any better. Uh, but that's, of course, a lot of the logic in terms of what's happening in terms of the, the, the military. So absolutely, one of our arguments should be and must be that, you know, when we're looking at transformation of sectors, you know, that the, the argument about transforming the military isn't about reducing their carbon footprint. It's asking, why do we need military like that? Why do we need an expansion of, mil of the military? Why in this moment, when you need solidarity and cooperation to deal with a global problem, is the idea that either one competitive advantage or, or two, that, you know, a militarized responses are going to be the, you know, the solutions of, of, of the future. That's lovely. Um, can I ask uh, Pam Flynn and then Linda Walker uh, and then Ruth Lambert to ask their questions? And then I've got one final one after that. <laughs> so, thank Pam. You. Yes, thank you. C can you hear me? I have unmuted. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Lovely. Good. Um, Assad, um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to the COP26 coalition, because I attended a lot of the events that were um, in, in um, civil settings um, within Glasgow, educational events, panels, a rally, the rally at which you spoke, various things. Um, so it wasn't necessary to be at the COP to have a, a fantastic learning event. Um, experience. Um, so um, having said that, and now returning to Manchester, I noticed yesterday uh, that the British government is sending troops to Poland to support the border um, um, uh, with Belarus. Um, and uh, I take it that this is in order to keep out um, the uh, people who are who have been um, forced up to the border with Poland, but it's under the auspices of NATO. And there were various quotations in yesterday's Guardian about um, it's, it's apparently engineering support on behalf of NATO. Now, I'd just like to have your perspective on that, please. What do you think is behind it? Oh. Okay. Um then if we could have uh, Linda, uh, Linda Walker's question and then Ruth's. Hey, thank you. Um, the COP26 coalition it will be meeting again soon to look at how to carry on campaigning following the conference. And early next year, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty will be reviewed. Mm. And it would be really great if the wider movement around the COP26 coalition could get involved in speaking out about um, the nuclear threat and the need to strengthen the treaty. Um, the fact that all the, the, the global north basically are threatening the whole world with nuclear annihilation. And War on One is one of the few um, NGOs really from the environment and development movement who really understand the links with militarism and the nuclear threat. And as I said, you're such a, an influential part of the COP26 coalition and the whole global justice movement. It would be just brilliant if you could encourage other organisations to be to be thinking about nuclear weapons, which, of course, could be the shortcut to making life on Earth unlivable. And finally, uh, Ruth, could you put your question, Ruth Lambert? 
I have kind of combination of questions because I think our very language and psyche has been hijacked. And I don't think we understand anymore when we talk about the maths, the money, the figures. Is it, is it not time for a new cancelled debt kind of thinking? Is it not time for um, being straight about security as opposed to can we give people peace in their hearts and in their beings that they will have enough water, they'll have enough clean air, they'll have enough food rather than the security in the military kind of sense. And then of course, again, with the nuclear is the nuclear, yeah, Poland, you know, military. It's all protecting us, but it never protected us against COVID and it can't protect us against climate heating. So do you see what I'm saying? It's as though our language no longer is the language of logic and everybody swallows it. And I'm here glued to my screen, learning all these things, the scales falling from my eyes. And all my neighbors think I'm becoming a hermit. Ah. <laughs> okay, over to you, Asa. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the easy ones because I, I, I maybe look at, <laughs> Uh, other other polar others uh, to answer the Poland question because I, I have to say I, I have been so uh, um, I suppose focused on, on the climate negotiations the whole world could somewhat happen that I, I wouldn't even be aware of it at this moment. Um, we might we might just we might just drop the Poland question. I mean, whatever bad ever happens in Poland apart from 1939 and so. So so. Um, First of all, uh, I really appreciate the, the, the comment about the COP26 coalition. Um, we, you know, when we founded it uh, as, as War and Want, um, we, as I said, we, we set out with a very, very different vision from the traditional sort of climate mobilizations, which have been about environmental actions or, you know, talk, I mean, really important, but the imagery of polar bears on icebergs or of people just drowning and, and you know their necks underwater, you know, depoliticized the climate issue from being a structural issue, and it actually just reinforced this idea that we were all passive in this story, right? That it was going to be solved by somebody else rather than actually a real question about this is about society and the economy that we want to do. So when we were doing the COP26 coalition, we committed ourselves that one of the things that we would do would use this opportunity to really deepen people's political education and understanding, create spaces for people to be able to come together in movement. And, and, and obviously we've had to do that with huge challenges during the pandemic and, 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 and do that online. We organized quite deep conversations on a whole number of different issues, did uh, from the ground up, so big events, really trying to bring that glo global perspective back into the UK movement. And many people were, of course, talking about the, the securitization agenda as part, parcel of it, as part of either the realities of environmental defense and what that actually was. It wasn't somebody who was just going around shooting people. It was actually that it was, you know, that the role of corporations creating this and what the state was doing to, you know, protect commodities and the, and the, and the extraction of these commodities. And then with the People's Summit, we so absolutely, we said um, that in Glasgow, um, we would create a very, very different experience than the inaccessibility of the of the actual main negotiations. So we had, you know, 250 events, not only in person, but also online as well, because we recognize that many people were uh, unable to attend. Uh, you can go to the COP26 website. A number of the events were streamed, so they're, 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 they're up there. Um, and for us to have really an ability to be able to have a conversation again, face to face, right? We've all been atomized. We're looking at each other through uh, Zoom screens and have a very, very flat reaction. That flat interaction, that hasn't allowed us to build movements, right? Yeah, we're good, we can exchange information, but that real work that comes from having deep conversations, thinking about how do you address this, that's, you know, we've tried to do that. And of course, in these coming months, we need to do that again. And we've been working on, as I said, this idea of, of, of a global Green New Deal. And very committed as part of the 10 areas that are critical 
is this question about militarism and security and really trying to make sure that the our movement's vision of the going forward doesn't see all of these things as afterthoughts but sees them as as a as part and parcel of the demands that we need to make and that's why i said you know one of our challenges is moving people away from thinking that the answer to climate is simply saying end fossil fuels it's not it, it, it's, a, it's a more systemic and we have to take people on that journey and it's beginning to see i see i think we're beginning to see the results of that if you look at for example the mobilization on, in glasgow it wasn't just environmentalists you really saw a huge breadth of different organizations the conversations that were happening the demands that were on there the groups that were being platformed was all were all drawn from this new movement to movements approach so i've put in there a link to 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 be part of that conversation about a global green new deal uh, absolutely you know before covid we were planning like a major gathering of movements and thinkers from the south and the north um to think like how do we how do we do all of these things what's the story we want to tell because we you know we all know that you know, you know to transform anything and you need to have a vision of the world and you need to be able to describe it you need to have concrete political demands that people can get behind and can fight for and you need to build power because these things are not possible without us building power and without those three components you know other forces are going to shape this reality uh, 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 the, the, of the of the future. So I absolutely do think it's really important that we 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 do this. And uh, just on the nuclear pro pro proliferation and, and and nuclear as a whole, I mean, it's very very concerning that you see, for example, one of the big lobbies in the climate negotiations is the nuclear industry, right? Saying nuclear for climate, young people for nuclear. I mean, it's they're all AstroTurf new campaigning organizations, which are clearly being bankrolled by the nuclear industry, but they are saying we are the solution in this, right? And 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 we, again, that's what, <laughs> what everybody's fighting for now is, you know, legitimizing themselves using climate as the argument as to why they need to be you know, get the resources of the state, be normalized and be part of the solution. And our job is, of course, to shut as many doors as possible on on those. Uh, and so we don't re reproduce the, 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 the logics of, of, of the of militarized extractivism, extractivism that we've seen for, you know, I'd say centuries, but particularly in, in, in these last decades. So absolutely really important. This is not going to happen by anybody else. Right. I keep saying my, you know, my, I suppose, feel like a broken record is nobody's coming over the hill to save us, right? No new movements coming. We are the movement. And it's a question of us now thinking how and what will our new movement look like? How do we weave all of these issues together? So they don't just become a long laundry list, but we recognize there are certain threads that you need to unpull. Uh, you know, Aaron Dutty Roy has this beautiful metaphor where she says, you know, Neoliberalism has created, you know, this tapestry uh, and we have to unpick a thousand different threads to create this new world. But there are certain threads that run through that if you pulled them, you know, actually open up lots of possibilities. And militarism and security is one of those threads. And we have to now make sure that it's a really central part of this conversation going forward. And it's a really central part of our demands going forward as well. Because if we don't, you know, we can um, we can pull some other threads but there'll be uh, these, uh, uh, yeah, we will leave a lot there. Thanks, thanks, Asad. Um, thank you so much, both for the talk, but also for your work in creating the People's Summit, because among other organizations that enabled us here at Moore to be able to get our voice heard. Um, thank you for an hour and a half of bursting with ideas um, people are asking for the, the links and stuff. I'll, we'll be sending them out. Um, I must say, I, I thought that for somebody who's been on two or three hours sleep, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And can I, can I end the 21st More Remembrance Lecture? Thank you all, and thank you all for coming. Bye. Bye.